Next tonight, the family whose life has been turned upside down by Tourette's syndrome. Twelve-year-old twins, Thomas and Jason Harvey, from Felixstowe in Suffolk, were diagnosed with the condition two years ago. Well, now their mother, Vanessa, says their symptoms are getting progressively worse and there's no support locally to help them. Lorna Ramsey has more on that. A typical meal time with Jason and Thomas Harvey. But while most parents would tell their children off for this behaviour, Vanessa knows it's part of a complex disorder which they both suffer from. Thomas has severe twitches and shouts, while Jason throws things and swears uncontrollably, which is the most publicised form of Tourette syndrome, but is actually the most rare. It's very difficult. Um, we've had to change how we live our lives, um, eating meals, um, going to the dentist, hairdressers, um, everything like that. We've all had to adapt and we've all found it quite difficult. There were no signs of the condition when Thomas and Jason were babies, but they started at the age of five. And now puberty is setting in, the physical and verbal tics are getting more severe. Since I've had it for a while, Sort of thinking that I don't think I'll be able to live without it. Which I find really weird because I hate it and want it gone, but I don't think I'll be able to live without it. I sometimes get a bit nervous when I'm around like people I haven't really met because sometimes I just get told to shush or like kids here, can you like watch your language and that. If I did actually know more about it, then I'd feel more comfortable. He just jumped! Tourette's syndrome was first discovered in 1885. The cause isn't known, but it is genetic, and it affects more than 300,000 people in the UK. There's no known cure, and the medications available don't work for everyone, but behaviour therapies have been shown to be an effective treatment. Habit reversal therapy which is a form of cognitive behaviour therapy, is most effective. And that means that people would look for signals at the beginning of their tick. So if you were going to sneeze, you often get a little tickle at the back of your throat. And it's teaching people to turn that signal into a reduced movement so their ticks aren't so apparent to other people. Vanessa and the boys are trying to raise awareness of the condition. So when they're out and about in their hometown of Felixstowe, they can have the same level of understanding as other disabled people. Jason and Thomas go to separate schools because their parents want them to be their own people. They know the condition will never leave them completely, but with more help and support, they could learn to lessen the effects of this widely misunderstood condition. Lorna Ramsey, Anglia News, Felixstowe. And if you want more information on Tourette's syndrome, you can find out how to contact Tourette's Action through our website. That's itv.com forward slash Anglia. Well, next, the change in the law that could have worrying implications for the safety of people living in bedsits. From today, landlords don't need planning permission to divide up their houses for several tenants. Milton Keynes Council is worried they could slip off the radar. It's fighting the move following the fire in a shared house in the town that led to the death of a mother and her daughter. Neil Bradford has this report. Hidden behind manicured dual carriageways and tree-lined boulevards are the housing estates of one of Britain's most modern towns. Estates which themselves are hiding a very modern problem. Thousands of homes in Milton Keynes designed for families have now been converted into bedsits. Many are legal and above board, but many more are not. Well, they, they fulfill a definite housing need, but particularly the unlicensed ones have problems with noise, uh, with rubbish dumped outside, um, with parking problems. But most of all, uh, with a concentration of HIMOs in one area, you get a lot of community. A transient population just don't feel responsible for their community. Last month, a mother and her three-year-old daughter died following a fire at their illegal bedsit in the Fishermead area of the town. Such was the uncertainty of how many people were living in the house. It was almost 36 hours before firefighters discovered the bodies of Bola and Fian AGI Fumalayo. Following that fire, the tenants of this unlicensed shared house agreed to let us film if we didn't identify them. 
It was home to four adults and two children, with rooms costing between 70 and 100 pounds a week. For neighbours, last month's fire has brought the issue of bedsits sharply into focus. Well, safety is always a worry anyway, because when you've got that many people in a house... Too many people in a house, getting them all out and not having things blocking the doors, obviously, because so many people, so much stuff. Maybe the landlord, they don't take care of like uh, putting the fire alarm. If there was a fire alarm, I don't think if that what will happen. Landlords who convert their homes into bedsits need a license if their house is three storeys or more, houses five or more occupants from two or more families who all share a kitchen and bathroom. From today, though, landlords no longer need to ask for planning permission. Milton Keynes Council says today's change in legislation will take away many of its powers. We will lose control of uh, the effect on neighbourhoods. We won't lose control of safety, but we will not be able to control how many there are, where there are, and all sorts of things that flow from that. We really must be able to protect our neighbourhoods. Milton Keynes is still hoping it can overturn the new law despite a failed legal challenge in the High Court. The government now has seven days to respond. There's no question that houses in multiple occupancy fulfil a very important role in the housing market, particularly in these difficult economic times. But local authorities say they need the appropriate powers to police them properly. Neil Bradford, Anglia News, Milton Keynes. OK, it's coming up to 17 minutes past six. More news and that all-important weekend weather to come. Let's hope it gets a little bit better than yeah. that outside. It <laughs> is horrible out there. We've also got the Friday night football preview. Going head-to-head, -head, but can the Dons put a stop to Colchester's bid for a record start to the season? Caught on camera, an amazing record of the missions flown by a second World War pilot before his plane came down. Well, it has been another windy day of dark clouds and the risk of rain in Norwich. And really very little changes for us all initially into tonight, but tomorrow at least you'll have a brighter start. But for all the details on this weekend's weather, do join me later in the programme. See you then. Now they cost nearly half a million pounds, but brand new speed cameras installed along a road in Norfolk may never be switched on. It's because the county's speed cameras are likely to be scrapped to save money. Road safety campaigners warn it could cost lives. Serena Sandu has more on that. Thousands of motorists use this stretch of the A149 in Norfolk every year and it's notorious for accidents with 127 casualties, including nine fatalities since 2003. This is just one of six sets of average speed cameras that were installed here on the A149 six months ago at a cost of nearly half a million pounds. But now it seems they may never be switched on. It's after Norfolk Safety Camera Partnership, which runs the county's speed cameras, was closed down after the county council voted to stop funding it. The Taxpayers Alliance says it's a disgraceful case of wasteful spending, and that's echoed by the town council. There's a lot of better things it could have been spent on. We've never been told they weren't switched on. Um, we thought it was expensive and not necessarily worth the money, but it was a good idea. Brian Tyler has lived alongside the A149 for more than 30 years and says the presence of the speed cameras has acted as a successful deterrent and they should not be removed. Well, after many years of it being used as a, a racetrack down here, um, and you'll hear them accelerating from way back up the road there before they even hit this stretch, it has quieted it all down. Liz Voicey from Deerham knows more than most about the consequences of speed. She lost her daughter Amy six years ago after a van ploughed into her parked car. She's campaigned for road safety ever since. If you take these safety measures off the roads, you will in an instant dismiss the value of the lives of people like my daughter Amy. She didn't deserve to die that day, but she did because somebody chose to bro break the law. A final decision on whether to axe the speed cameras will be announced on the 11th of October, but road safety campaigners hope that any potential savings don't end up costing lives. Serena Sandu, Anglia News, Dalham.
A Lithuanian man accused of causing a train crash in Suffolk has appeared in court in Bury St Edmunds. Arvidas Patasius from Littleport in Cambridgeshire was driving the lorry involved in the crash on an unmanned level crossing at Little Cornard near Sudbury in August. 21 people were injured. He was ordered to appear at Ipswich Crown Court in four weeks' time. Norfolk County Council's leader is standing down after just three years. Daniel Cox is swapping life in East Anglia to take up voluntary work in India. The move comes as the County Council faces a huge cuts programme. Daniel and his wife start their new life in Delhi next month. The people of Sheringham in Norfolk have voted decisively in favour of having a supermarket in the town. 82% of people who took part in a public vote yesterday said they wanted a supermarket. Voters were also asked their preference, with Tesco nudging ahead of Waitrose by just 15 votes. The battle over whether a supermarket should be built in the town has been going on now for 13 years. I think there should be a Tesco because it would help out a lot of people because... It's, it'll be local and it'll still bring people into the town. Well, we have to go out of town to do a shop and you just can't buy it in Sheringham and everything's all overpriced. Well, I don't know a huge supermarket in this lovely little town. Right, let's have some football now and a 4-3 win during the week may have been exciting for all Norwich fans, but it resulted in the latest managerial casualty in the championship with Paolo Sosa leaving Leicester City. Meanwhile, Donovan Blake starts our Friday preview with the... Next tonight, the remarkable story of an American World War II pilot who had a lucky escape when his plane crashed in Essex. Lieutenant John Gokey of the 339th Fighter Group was on his way to Germany when his Mustang ran into engine trouble. He parachuted to safety in Frinton, where his aircraft crash-landed and remained buried for years. Victoria Lampard takes up the story. Spring 1944, and American pilot Lieutenant John Goki is flying his Mustang in Europe. Five of his missions captured by the gun camera. It's footage that's just been developed and adds to the tale of this Cambridgeshire based serviceman who, on the 11th of December 1944, may have landed safely by parachute, but his Mustang left quite a mark on one of our seaside towns. The aircraft came flying in from the east with its engine on fire, crashing into this part of the garden in Frinton. Now, luckily at the time, those houses behind the garden hadn't been built. If they had, the aircraft likely to have crashed into those and there could have been fatalities. Lieutenant Goki's morning began that day at his base in Falmere. He was heading for Liège in Belgium, where his mission was to escort B-17 Flying Fortress bombers to Gissen in Germany. But when he reached Ostend, engine problems forced him to turn back. He was en route to Woodbridge to make an emergency landing when his engine caught fire and he had to bail out. He landed by parachute in Pole Barn Lane in Frinton. The Mustang carried on, crashing into the garden in 3rd Avenue shortly before 11 a.m. And for more than 50 years, the wreckage lay underground until volunteers at the East Essex Aviation Museum received a phone call from the owner of the garden, and that led them to organise a dig. This particular bit here used to be his vegetable patch, and he kept unearthing big chunks of aluminium, 50 calibre ammunition, and various bits and pieces of aluminium, and it just made him think he'd got an aircraft here. Twelve feet below the surface, they came across a treasure trove, the Mustang's engine, parts of the cockpit and various other instruments from the aircraft. In the TARDIS, that is the East Essex Aviation Museum in St Osif, there's a Mustang identical to Lieutenant Gokey's, and just around the corner are all the parts recovered from the garden at 3rd Avenue. This is a piece of perspex from the cockpit, which tends to go pink and purple, as you can see there, because of the heat from the fire. Um, that would have been the last thing he touched as he, as he exited the aircraft. When Lieutenant Goki's daughter heard of the discovery, she visited the museum and donated her father's flying jacket as well as the gun camera film. To think that the guy bowed out and it laid underground for, I don't know, the best part, about 60 years, and then we turn up to think that that film was shot by this guy, some of it in this particular aircraft and we've now got it, and before too much longer his daughter will have it out in the States, and she's never seen it. So, fantastic stuff. Their next task, to discover where in Europe this footage was taken and fill in more of the gaps of this pilot's past. Victoria Lampard, Anglia News, Frinton-on-Sea.
an incredible find. What a story. Yeah. Now it's fast approaching half six, which is when we leave your screen and the national team take over. Here's what's coming up. Coming up on the ITV News, limited.